In our previous episode on the history of the First Age, we described the Siege of Angband, the coming of the humans, Edain, and the ever-increasing prosperity of the Elven realms. While the Elves had enjoyed peace, content with the fact that the Dark Lord was contained within Thangorodrim, they could not launch more than the most insignificant sorties. This was all to change with the fourth great battle of the War of the Jewels, the Dagor Bregalach, the Battle of Sudden Flame. Imagine how much trouble the Dark Lord Morgoth would get up to in the modern day. Then take what you imagined and turn it into a character in this video's sponsor, City of Mist. It's a tabletop RPG in the vein of D&D, but you play as an everyday person in the modern world with just a little twist. Your hero can draw on the power of legendary characters who can be pretty much whatever you want. So Morgoth, Skywalker, Shrek, all the great powers of modern mythology are yours to use. Or you can even use broader concepts like the power of evolution. This makes your hero very customizable, and the game keeps things easy by minimizing the stats and numbers you need to play, so it's easier to get into than D&D, focusing more on story elements and creativity. Your character sheet will have everything you need to play, the game comes with loads of adventures and content to use in their starter pack, and ready-made campaigns. Then there's fan-made stuff on top of that, really too much to look at here. Right now, during their Black Friday sale, you get up to 50% off City of Mist bundles, so go take a look at our link in the description. The Noldor defences had held against all assaults the Dark Lord had sent their way following their great victory in the Dagor Aglareb. This forced Morgoth to change tact, as he had realised orcs alone were no match for the besiegers. Instead, he relied on spies to decide his next significant foray into Beleriand. The superiority of the elves at this time was evidenced by the green grass which had begun to grow even at the gates of Angband. This was purely symbolic, as Morgoth had bred an innumerable force of orcs and other fell beasts within the expanse of Angband. Still, something greater than orcs would be required to take on the elves, and Morgoth created the first dragon. The Noldor, unaware of the creation of a beast of such unprecedented power, had even considered launching an assault upon the gates of Angband. Yet despite the best plans of Fingulfin, the doom of Mandos still hung over the Noldor, and even at the height of their powers, such a victory lay beyond their grasp. While nearly all of the elven lords had rejected this plan due to the immense losses that would be incurred, they remained unaware of the futility of their continued struggle, even when their position was at its most secure. Morgoth had been aware of his strengths, yet he arrogantly underestimated the combined power of men and elves, which prompted him to assault the alliance before he had amassed enough force to destroy the free peoples. The Dagor Bregolach was to begin upon a bitterly cold night, in the middle of winter of the year 455 of the First Age. At this point in the four centuries-long siege, the elves had become laxer in their vigilance, which was to prove nigh-on catastrophic for their people. On a night in which the watch was particularly lax, in no small part due to the fierce intensity of the cold, Thangorodrim and the Iron Mountains loosed a flood of flame and noxious gases. The green grass which had grown over the past 400 years across Ardgallon was consumed, to be replaced by a vast sweeping desert, which was renamed Anfalglyph, the Gasping Dust. There came a time of winter, when night was dark and without moon, and the wide plain of Ardgallan stretched dim beneath the cold stars, from the hill forts of the Noldor to the feet of Thangorodrim. The watchfires burned low, and the guards were few. On the plain, few were waking in the camps of the horsemen of Hithlum. Then suddenly, Morgoth sent forth great rivers of flame that ran down swifter than Balrogs from Thangorodrim, and poured all over the plain, and the mountains of iron belched forth fires of many poisonous hues, and the fume of them stank upon the air and was deadly. Thus Ard Galen perished. Many of the elves were killed immediately by this unprecedented attack, while the survivors fled. The elven horsemen rode south desperately to warn their brethren of what came in their wake. Their primary consideration, however, was merely survival. The legions of Morgoth followed the fires, and their composition primarily consisted of orcs, of such numbers the elves had never before witnessed, 
supplemented with Balrogs, and Glaurung, the father of dragons, the most brutal of the Dark Lord's servants. Morgoth's strategy was simple, yet exceedingly deadly, even in the face of the formidable defences the elves had erected during the Great Peace. The haste of the advance was so great that the ring of fortifications, which consisted of the individual elven kingdoms, was isolated and forced to fight alone. Though many would have despaired in the face of such darkness, the elves and their Edain allies steeled themselves for the fight to come, with only valour to provide solace. Despite their bravery, the highlands of Dothonion were overrun in short order. The free peoples made the orcs pay for every inch of land they took. According to our chronicler, the sons of Finarfin bore most heavily the brunt of the assault, and Angrod and Ignor were slain. Beside them fell Bregolas, lord of the house of Beor, and a great part of the warriors of that people. Upon the plain of Lothlan, Many of Maglor's horsemen were burnt to a crisp by the intense flames of the Father of Dragons. Now practically undefended, Maglor's gap was taken by the legions of orcs who followed Glaurung. This gave the Dark Lord passage to Beleriand. Maglor took with him what warriors had survived the onslaught and retreated to Himring, where they provided vital assistance to Mithros. The fortress, supplemented by the bright blades and the ash-stained hauberks of Maglor's riders, withstood the onslaught. Mithros hefted his blade in his only hand, cutting a bloody swath through the legions of the Dark Lord wherever it was required of him. The situation remained desperate on all fronts, however. The ferocity of the sons of Fionor, Celegorm and Curufin alone could not hold the pass of Aglon, and they were forced to retreat in the face of the Black Legions of Morgoth. With the sons of the greatest scion of the elvish race unable to stand in their way, the orcs streamed through Mount Reria and moved into East Beleriand. They eventually despoiled the landscape and slaughtered the elves and Edain who resided there. Glaurung then polluted and defiled Lake Helavon, permanently marring its beauty. Caranthia, the darkest and most brutal of the sons of Fionor, realized the futility of the defense of his position and retreated back to the hill of Amon Ereb. There, he and Amrod, Fionor's youngest son, had constructed formidable defenses to be used as the bedrock of the counter-offensive to come. This counter-attack allowed for a methodical and slow-paced approach to reclaim the despoiled lands of Eastern Beleriand, and was only made possible through the courage displayed by Maglor and Mithros to the north. Here, the Dark Lord's forces broke as a wave upon a clifftop, the brothers unwilling to bend or break before this tide, allowing their kinsmen the breathing room necessary to either hold or break forward. The ferocity of Mithros in those days was unmatched, allowing him to initiate his counter-offensive, and he reclaimed the Pass of Aglon as a result. This action plugged a glaring gap in the elvish lines, which effectively denied the denizens of the Dark entrance into Beleriand through this avenue. In the western reaches of the elvish lines, Minas Tirith's proud and stoutly built watchtower stood its silent vigil upon the Pass of Syrian. King Finrod Felagund built this tower, and its command lay with Oradreth, son of Finarfin. Having been made aware of the breaking of the Siege of Angband, Finrod hastily amassed a mighty host and marched to reinforce the pass. The king was caught unawares by an innumerable orcish rabble and ambushed at the marshy fens of Serek, where the orcs inflicted a heavy toll upon the elves, which effectively avenged the brutal destruction of their ancestors during the Dagon Nuin Gilead. The numbers of orcs were so great that the king himself was almost slain, if not for the timely intervention of King Barahir and the men of Dothonion. Barahir had become aware of the plight of his elvish allies and descended upon the orcs, reaping a brutal harvest of black blood and misshapen bodies, which allowed him to rescue the king. Finrod, who had barely escaped with his life, owed a debt of gratitude to this man of the House of Beor, one which he could never truly repay. Yet as a form of immediate compensation for the bravery of the Edine, Finrod bestowed upon Barahir one of his rings. This would eventually become known as the Ring of Barahir, and was passed down through generations of man, eventually reaching a certain Aragorn, son of Arathorn, the future King Elisar. In conjunction with the Ring, Finrod also swore a solemn oath on that bloody day that he would answer if Barahir or his kin called for aid. 
After this exchange, Finrod led what remained of his host and people south to Nagathrond. Barahir would not so quickly leave his home to the vile machinations of the servants of Morgoth. This great king of the Adain fought with every ounce of his being against what seemed to be the great doom of the alliance of men and elves. The struggle was brutal, with the men of Dothonian unable to match the seemingly endless tide of orcs which continued to sow death and destruction. The Edain of the House of Beor slowly died almost to a man, which left a band of twelve men to Barahir, with which he would continue the fight. The remaining women and children fled to the forest Brethil, though their path was long and dangerous. Fortunately, however, the mountain forts of the mountain range of Ered Wethrin, surrounding the region of Hithlum, were able to hold. The assault upon these well-wrought and valiantly defended bastions was a horrifying sight to behold, as the garrisons barely held, in no small part due to the protections afforded by the mountains against the fires of Morgoth. The Dagor Bragalach had brought crashing down the watchful peace and the siege of Angband. The roiling rivers of flame and hosts of misshapen cruel orcish warriors which followed in its destructive wake had scattered the sons of Fëanor across the north. These brave warriors harnessed the ferocity and prowess of their forebear to hold the line despite near cataclysmic casualties. However, this was not the end of the catastrophic losses the elvish people would suffer during the fourth great battle of the War of the Jewels, as word had reached the High King of what had occurred. The High King of the Noldor, Fingolfin, one who stood upon the very highest echelon of the elvish people since their coming in the wake of Fëanor's fury, was overwrought with grief and despair. The immense casualties detailed to the High King threatened to overcome him, as he believed that his people could never recover from the ruination which had been visited upon the Noldor. Yet from the depths of his desperation, Fingolfin emerged bearing a rage of such inexpressible fury that he was likened to the Valar Oromi. The High King threw all caution to the wind. In early 456, he mounted as swift a steed as he could find, set his eye upon the darkness threatening the destruction of the free peoples, and rode north to meet it head on. None dared halt his advance as his steed carried him across the once green plains of Ard Galen, now forever desolated by the malice of Morgoth, until he came to the gates of Angband. The High King dismounted, and with bravery unmatched since the very artificer of the Silmarils had drawn his final breath, challenged the Dark Lord to single combat. Fingolfin smote upon the gates of Angband and cried out his challenge for all to hear, and although Morgoth remained near the apex of his strength, he hesitated. In those days, the Dark Lord was deemed to be the mightiest of all things in this world, yet he hesitated and knew the most mortal of emotions in that brief moment. Faced with the righteous fury and incredible courage of one of the mightiest warriors ever to grace the lands of Middle-earth, the Dark Lord Morgoth knew the chilling iciness of fear that pierced his very being. Yet the challenge issued by the High King could not remain unanswered. In the depths of Angband, Morgoth arrayed himself. He donned black armor and took up his mighty warhammer Grond, the Hammer of the Underworld. The massive gates of Angband swung open, and the Dark Lord strode forward to meet his foe, as his servants watched on expectantly. Undeterred by the inescapable doom of Mandos, Fingolfin knew no fear and drew from its sheath the blade Ringil. According to the chronicler, Fingolfin gleamed beneath it as a star, for his mail was overlaid with silver, and his blue shield was set with crystals, and he drew his sword Ringil that glittered like ice. The duel commenced, with the combatants making a direct tilt for one another. Morgoth hefted Grond, attempting to end the conflict with a single blow, and each strike of the Hammer of the Underworld brought with it the fierce intensity of a lightning strike, leaving a smoldering crater where it struck the ground. Yet Fingolfin displayed the grace and poise characteristic of his people and avoided each blow. Calmly he struck Morgoth back, before nimbly avoiding yet another killing blow from Grom. Seven such strikes were landed upon the Dark Lord, with Ringil biting with an icy chill each time it struck, and it is said that the craters left by Grond were filled with the blood of the Warhammer's wielder. Despite the strength of the High King, he was just an elf, 
and his opponent was one of the mightiest of the Valor. Fingolfin grew weary, and his weariness was to be his downfall. On three separate occasions, the Dark Lord made contact with his fearsome strikes, and in each instance, the High King rose to his feet and continued the fight. None could discredit the strength of character this required, yet each time Fingolfin rose, his feet were less steady and his evasions of the hammer strike increasingly ragged. Courage alone would prove insufficient in discrediting the doom of Mandos, and on that day it was proven true that no power of the elves alone could defeat Morgoth. Fingolfin, in his weariness, became less and less aware of his surroundings, and, in a desperate attempt to evade Grond once more, stumbled into one of the craters the hammer had created. Morgoth now knew that victory was imminent and descended into the crater. Here he placed a great armoured boot upon Fingolfin's neck. This ended the life of the High King. However, with what energy remained, Fingolfin struck out one last time with the icy blade Ringil. His last sword stroke left a brutal impression upon the heel of the Dark Lord who had already been weakened by grasping the Silmarils and in the labours required to corrupt Arda. The elf's strike left Morgoth with a permanent limp. Having slain the High King of the Noldor, Morgoth's undeniable malice shone through in the actions which followed. He took the body and broke it, with the vile intent of feeding what had indeed been a noble challenger to his wolves. Yet this would not come to be, the King of the Eagles, Thorondor, unwilling to let such an indignity come to pass, swooped down from the skies and slashed Morgoth's face with his fierce talons. This caught the Dark Lord unawares, which allowed the King of the Eagles to reclaim the High King of the Noldor's broken body. Thorondor brought the body to a mountaintop that overlooked Gondolin's hidden city within its protective valley. Turgon, heartbroken for the death of his forebear, raised a cairn to guard over Fingolfin's remains, and Fingon, with a deep wrenching sorrow within his heart, took upon himself the title of High King of the Noldor. The elves would never make songs celebrating the valiant battle a mere elf had waged against a being of such unquantifiable power as Morgoth, for they endured such heartbreak and despair even at the thought of his passing. Nor did the orcs ever create crude or boastful songs to jeer the loss of their foe's great high king, even though the victory belonged to their master. Morgoth, though victorious, would bear the limp and wounds inflicted upon him by Fingolfin and Thorondor until the very dying days of the War of Wrath. The aftermath of the Dagor Bragalach was a stalemate of sorts. Although Morgoth remained nominally the victor, the victory threatened to be Pyrrhic if he did not proceed cautiously. The Dark Lord's losses were significant, as the Elves had already begun a successful, if measured, counter-offensive. He had underestimated the valour and strength of the Elves, whose spirited resistance had not been accounted for in his plans. The actions of the Edain and their bravery, perhaps despite or maybe due to their mortality, had also prevented the complete victory Morgoth sought so desperately. As a result, he withdrew the main host of his Orcish legions within the gates of Angband, and began to devise a strategy to bring the free people's unnumbered tears. The Dagor Bragalach, although brutal and nigh on cataclysmic for the Elves and Edain, was little more than a warning of what would come in the grander scheme. However, this is the story for our next documentary on the history of the First Age. The next few videos in this series will be dedicated to the continued battles of the War of the Jewels, but we're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment, we'll try to read and respond to every comment as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel and we'll catch you on the next one.